you're, uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, because uh, Peter is uh, uh, not only a, um, a former Lamaze instructor, he's also an economist. And the uh, uh, child of uh, an artist. Uh, so we keep making these connections. Uh, it's really amazing. And Peter, uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of knowing for a very long time when he was back at the uh, University of Louisville, uh, now uh, Professor Emeritus at UofL, um, knows about community development, knows about environmental trends and issues, and I've asked him to come and talk about, um, you know, the sort of the 800-pound gorilla, okay? Uh, global warming, the environmental issues, all of these have very important implications uh, for Kentucky. Uh, we're a coal state. Uh, and we're, we're, we're moving into a carbon-averse um, world, increasingly. And that's going to have important implications for our state. And I've asked Peter to come and talk about that. Peter Meyer, thank you. You want to finish off the connections? The last time I took a yoga class was before I moved down into Kentucky from Pennsylvania back in, the 19, in 1988. Uh, it's kind of funny, I, I realized uh, after I sent in this PowerPoint to Mike that uh, I'd actually created this rather peculiar situation. The thing I did with Mike some 15 years ago was something called forecasting Kentucky's environmental future. So I've gone from forecasting to trying to shape it, which I th think is much more proactive. We're going to try and do something about this. Um, and uh, I should also add, with regard to the environment, that uh, Doug Henton made reference to the fact that, you know, we use silicon in creative ways, but it's really something that's a very common resource, namely sand. Uh, what you may not realize about sand is that sand depends on coral reefs, or did once upon a time, because all the sand that you know and that you have enjoyed over your lifetime is, in fact, fish poop. You heard me correctly. It's the product of what are called squirrel fish that eat coral. All right. Having made the necessary connections now, which I wasn't planning on doing, let me proceed from here. All right. Um, what am I doing here? Oh, there we are. Uh, first of all, there's this interesting question about which environment are we looking at here. If I'm going to start trying and deal with this, we got a biophysical. That's about the only one we haven't talked about so far today. So theoretically, uh, that's what I'm contributing to this. But we have to remember that this is all part of the context in which things do or do not happen at the local level, at the state level. And we need to really look at all of these things. And they're all doing some interesting things at this point in time. Uh, and obviously, as I say, we're dealing with all of them. So let's take a look here. Uh, Louisville has had a problem with being non-attainment. I don't know whether you can see the caption there. It says blind date. Now, this is, uh, we haven't quite hit this problem with air quality. Our air quality, in fact, in Kentucky has been improving. But to the extent that it's bad, it's an economic development problem. And oh, by the way, I have heard stories in Louisville about the fact that there's certain firms that wouldn't come here because of the characteristics of the air quality. I'm not talking about the environment, I'm talking about economic development. Maybe I'm talking about community. But it's also a air quality problem in a slightly different way. Oh, by the way, that was not, that cartoon is a cartoon. This is Alloy, West Virginia in the 1970s. I'm pretty sure this is a photograph I saw on the cover of Business Week at some point then. We did do this kind of thing to ourselves. That is high noon on a bright, sunny day. But as I said, emissions are also a health issue. If you look at NOx and SOx, these are things that are not particularly good for human beings or for other things, I might add. GHG is greenhouse gases. If you look at Kentucky as compared to the nation as a whole, this is US national emissions data. In fact, you'll find that we produce more socks from our utilities because we use more coal than most. And we actually have got more socks and knocks coming out of our industrial, commercial, and residential buildings and operations. I will come back to that in a moment also. Uh, so basically, I suggest that we need to acknowledge and accept reality. These paintings may not be quite as good as some of those that are coming out of Paducah these days, but they can be used to cover something if we don't want to really accept reality. But we're going to try and do that, all right? So let's take a look at that biophysical environment for a moment. 
And I'm going to start with this little statement, which is not particularly well accepted in Kentucky and many other places. I'm not going to show you a picture of an ostrich with its head in the sand or anything like that. But I think you can read what I've got up there. Uh, the, the argument that there's not a consensus is a little bit silly, but I have a slightly different question for you, again, with due respect to the physician who just preceded me on this podium. How do you answer that question? If nine out of 10 surgeons tell you your partner needed surgery and one disagreed, would you ignore the nine in favor of the one? We don't need consensus on climate change. And I'm going to add another little question here, because the other issue that comes up with regard to our inability to do anything about climate change is this one. What would you do if you had those nine out of 10 and it bankrupted you to do it? I'll tell you what the very large number of American people do right now in this healthcare system. We keep hearing the stories about how many people get bankrupted. The majority of bankruptcies in the US are due to healthcare costs. So that's what people do. But it turns out that we don't need to bankrupt ourselves. And this is the interesting and important point here. I'm going to give you the latest estimates of costs to meet projected Copenhagen goals. Copenhagen is the meeting that is going to try and come up with a post-Kyoto agreement for, that's taking place in December of this year. The numbers just came out, obviously, last week. For 2020, a 15% reduction in U.S. emissions is going to be needed, according to this set of numbers. You're going to see another one later. All the numbers vary all the time. From week to week, I see different numbers. But take a look at the cost here. 48 billion roughly, 29.29, that's three-tenths of 1% of the GDP, gross domestic product, total output of the U.S. in the year 2020. You think the average Kentucky household can afford 33 cents a day? It's not that expensive. We're not gonna have to bankrupt ourselves. But won't Kentucky be hurt and perhaps more than the U.S. as a whole? Well, let's take a look. Yep, we're coal dependent, Mike just mentioned it. So it's gonna cost us more to adjust to the changes. But no, we can get more energy efficiency gains than most states since we now consume more inefficiently. You may remember, those of you that still remember this morning, that there was this discussion about the fact that we, have, we can very easily accomplish a great deal and improve a great deal in our health status because we're starting off with such poor health status. When it comes to energy efficiency, we have exactly the same situation in Kentucky. Uh, but we're also gonna get hurt because we have lower education levels and incomes, so we're more vulnerable. This, of course, assumes that we don't do anything about our schools. We can adjust our economy if we accept the need to change and start acting now, fast, before others do it ahead of us. And there are a lot that are ahead of us already, but that's something that we can overcome if we have the commitment to do it. And change can be difficult. You see that little thing there that says uh, actual danger right there? All right, this was originally about mad cow disease, but if you will, that's what climate deniers would tend to say. And then we've got this one here suggesting that the climate deniers are getting warmer whether they like it or not. So the fact is climate change can be difficult, but it is possible and that's what I wanna pursue with you. Let's remember about a little bit about political change, and I'm going to go through these very quickly. OPEC came in the 1970s. Nobody ever expected that the petrol, oil petroleum exporting countries could, in fact, form a cartel. They did so very successfully and had significant adverse effects on the U.S. economy. We had the decline of communism. Nobody forecasted that. All of a sudden, we have something called the European Union that started to flex its muscles in Europe a great deal and build some lot of influence. Nobody ever expected what happened in 2001. I think you remember what happened. Now we've got the Obama phenomenon. Anybody want to predict? I'm not going to predict. Just remember that things change, and sometimes change an awful lot faster than we allow it in our thinking about what the future is going to be like.